Indianapolis, Indiana, scene of the world's greatest race cars. This is Sid Collins saying welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. In the early 1900s, a remarkable invention took to the skies, and it forever changed the course of aviation history. It was a pioneering machine crafted by the brilliant minds of Orville and Wilbur Wright. With a combination of engineering genius and unyielding determination, the Wright brothers designed this magnificent biplane to be their first practical flying machine. And in 1909, the Wright Model A was purchased by the US Army as a military flyer. This was not the only revolutionary event that happened that year. Over 500 miles away in the Midwest, another creation was availed upon the world. One that attracted droves of spectators, all desperate to get a glimpse of the wonder in front of them. This was a creation envisioned by one man, Carl Graham Fisher. And while it may seem like just another oval racetrack, this place has become a temple of speed, calling to anyone who seeks the thrill of the race. It's a cathedral of horsepower and history, where the ghosts of racing's past haunt every turn. From its humble beginnings as a dirt track and homemade cars, to the high-tech marvels of modern racing machines, this motorsport mecca has seen it all. And the stories it tells are as thrilling as they are timeless. This is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Trouble, oh my goodness, what a huge crash. For the most famous words in all of motorsports. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. It's a world-renowned racing circuit in Speedway, Indiana, just outside Indianapolis. Many often refer to it as the Brickyard due to its original surface, which was made of brick. It's actually still around today, and there are some questionable traditions that are performed on it along with some others involving this race course. While being one of the most historic and prestigious racetracks in the world, it's also a venue for various events and activities, including concerts and car shows. Believe it or not, there's also a friggin' museum inside this place. The IMS Museum houses a vast collection of race cars, memorabilia, and treasures that would make any motorhead drool. Now, to appreciate this legendary place, you must understand its roots. Back in 1905, Indianapolis businessman Carl Graham Fisher had a vision. After witnessing the dominance of European automobile design and craftsmanship, he wanted to create a better way to test cars in the United States, but he also wanted to provide an exciting experience for spectators. He started crafting a circular track three to five miles long with broad, smooth surfaces, allowing manufacturers to test cars at high speeds and drivers to push their own limits. He took inspiration from the banked layout of the Brooklyn circuit in London. Fisher was determined to build the world's greatest racetrack in this Midwestern capital, which was already a hub for horseless carriage manufacturers. And after searching for the perfect site, Fisher and his partners purchased 328 acres of farmland and formed the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Company in 1909. They began work quickly. Fisher hired the best workers he could find and the track quickly took shape. Just in June of that year, the very first race was held at the newly formed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But it wasn't a car race. It was a balloon race. Yep, balloons, filled with hot air and gas. That event was held to kick off the extraordinary beginnings of this iconic venue. Fisher used it to generate revenue and increase awareness in the automobile races soon to come. It only attracted 3,500 paying customers inside the track. Outside, there was a massive traffic jam. Spectators came from all over the place, trying to get a glimpse at this. And that's where 40,000 spectators all watched for free from the outside. But it's said to have attracted over 80,000 in total for the event. Now, motorcycle races followed the balloon competition, and despite some challenges and accidents, racing continued and speed records were broken constantly. Fisher and his partners realized the need for improvements, leading to the idea of paving the track with bricks. And with the completion of that project, 
That's when the track earned its nickname of The Brickyard. Since then, it has become synonymous with the Indianapolis 500, one of the world's most famous and reputable motorsports events. The inaugural Indianapolis 500 took place in 1911, and it has been held annually on Memorial Day weekend ever since, except for a few during the wars. The track has a unique rectangular shape, and while it seems simple, the perfection and symmetry is just insane. And it can house 400,000 spectators, making it one of the most extensive sporting facilities in the world. Almost a half a million petrol heads here just to experience this place. And in addition to the Indianapolis 500, or the Indy 500 as many call it, the Speedway hosts other races as well, including NASCAR's Brickyard 400 and the IndyCar Series GMR Grand Prix. And over the years, the Speedway has witnessed numerous moments in motorsport history and has been the stage for some of the sport's most excellent drivers. It has also undergone several renovations and improvements, mainly to enhance safety and accommodate crowds. Now, the Motor Speedway is known for its rich traditions that have become integral to the Indianapolis 500 experience. Arguably, the most iconic tradition is the ground kiss. And that is when the driver wins the race here, they can kneel down and kiss the yard of bricks, which is a section of the track's finish line made up of the original paving bricks. And this tradition dates back all the way to the early years of the Speedway and symbolizes the respect and honor bestowed upon the victorious driver. And then of course you have the milk drinking tradition, which is a little strange to some, it's a ritual that began back in 1933 when the winning driver, Lewis Meyer, requested a glass of buttermilk to quench his thirst. I don't know about you, but warm milk after a race just doesn't sound great. It's so damn hot. Milk was a bad choice. But since then, milk has been associated with the victory at the Indianapolis 500, and it has become a cherished tradition that connects the race's past with the present. Now, there was one year in 1993 when Emerson Fittipaldi won and refused the milk. He even pushed it away at least three times when they were trying to hand it to him. Instead, he drank orange juice because Emerson was actually an orange juice producer in his hometown of Sao Paulo, and he drank that orange juice to promote the Brazilian citrus industry. Many practices make the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the Indy 500 special, such as the singing of Back Home Again in Indiana, which is performed before the start of the race, and also this huge release of balloons during the pre-race ceremonies. And these traditions add to the sense of history and excitement that make the Indianapolis 500 an unforgettable event. From its humble beginnings in 1909, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has become an emblem of excitement, tradition, and pageantry. The Indianapolis 500 has captivated racing enthusiasts for years and draws in everyone from around the world. You'll see all walks of life here from rednecks to royalty, all here just to watch the awe-inspiring madness of the race. And some cynics are here just to experience the carnage of the wrecks. Over the decades though, it has tirelessly worked on initiatives that extend beyond the realm of racing. It strives to promote improved health, education, and quality of life in its home community. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway takes pride in leveraging the power of its renowned events and create a lasting legacy for the city. And when you step inside the oval at the southern end of the track, you'll find the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. This incredible place immerses you in rich history and allure of the IndyCar racing scene. It beautifully showcases the evolution of race cars, both past and present, taking you on a journey through the fascinating world of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Don't forget to check out the Borg and Warner Trophy. This thing is amazing. It's an iconic symbol of victory and can't be missed. And if you're interested, you can delve into the captivating stories unfolding on this hollow ground. And as you walk through, you can see how the Indianapolis Motor Speedway's influence had an impact on automotive technology. Innovations developed and tested on the track have made their way into everyday vehicles, enhancing safety and performance. Technologies like four-wheel disc brakes, which were pioneered by Harry Miller in the late 1930s, which allowed race cars to be able to stop as effectively as possible. Just know that this track has served as a testing ground, pushing the boundaries of automotive engineering and benefiting drivers on both the track and the streets. 
Previous owners include Eddie Rickenbacker as well as Holman and Company, but currently it's owned and operated by transportation tycoon Roger Penske, who made this enormous purchase back in November of 2019. But it's not just his money. Penske's connection to the Speedway runs deep. At 14, he had a pivotal experience when his father, Jay Penske, obtained a pair of tickets to the 1951 Indy 500. This event proved to be a significant moment for Penske, inspiring his passion for racing and laying the foundation for his future involvement in the sport. It was from this early exposure that Penske's journey with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway began. Now, one forgotten aspect of the Indy 500 race was the use of a riding mechanic. These brave co-pilots would be sitting next to the race car driver, and they were tasked with maintaining, monitoring, and even repairing the car during the race. And due to the tight space and the weight, riding mechanics tended to be shorter stature and more petite built like a typical horse racing jockey. Now, several notable riding mechanics left their mark on the history of the Indy 500. Names like Harry Holcomb, Robert Bandini, and Monk Jordan stand out among them. And unsurprisingly, a few of these riding mechanics also pursued racing careers of their own, one of which was Jimmy Murphy, who won the 1922 Indy 500, but began his racing journey as a riding mechanic. Now, there was one rebel out there who didn't use a riding mechanic in 1911, and that was Ray Haroon. In doing so, he made racing history, and he did this by affixing a rear view mirror on his car, allowing him to see the others behind him, which was a task typically assigned to the mechanic. This innovation earned him the distinction of being the first driver to utilize a rear view mirror on a race car. And interestingly enough, Haroon credited his inspiration for the mirror to a similar device he had observed on a horse-drawn vehicle in 1904. And of course, after that first race, the AAA contest board mandated using riding mechanics for all races that were over 100 miles, which included the Indy 500. Now, in 1923, they became optional, and they were only utilized by one team. They were made mandatory again from 1930 to 1937. After 1937, they became optional again, and no teams ever used them. And as of 1964, the rulebook was changed and formally eliminated that position. While Ray Haroon was the first winner of the Indianapolis 500, this track has seen and created some of the most iconic drivers in history. Names like Andretti, Ari Leyendijk, The Unsers, Helio Castroneves, and AJ Foyt. It has also made history in other forms. Janet Guthrie was the first woman to race at the Indy 500, which opened the doorway for names like Lynn St. James, Sarah Fisher, and Danica Patrick. There were so many records and moments in history made here at the track that its legacy will continue to live on for another hundred years. And just like the Wright brothers, Carl Fisher's dream became a reality and has been a major milestone for all in the motorsports world. And for that, we owe thanks for paving the way for innovation, entertainment, and just pure insanity.